as so often seems to happen, during this time of year, <laughs> at least here on the Gulf Coast, another hurricane, Hurricane Barrel, has wreaked havoc in several places. At the time that I wrote this message, sermon message, Barrel was crossing Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, and it was targeting originally South Texas, which is where we were going to be doing a church visit and family visit on Sunday night, July 7th into today, which is Monday. Hurricane Barrel broke records as it left a path of destruction in the southeastern Caribbean. On June 30th, Sunday, Barrel became the first Category 4 storm ever to form in the Atlantic Ocean in the month of June. Then it made history again last Monday when it intensified the title as the strongest hurricane on record in the month of July. The previous record was Hurricane Dennis, which slammed into Cuba as a Category 4 on July 8th, 2005. No storm has reached Barrow's level of intensity so early in the hurricane season, which runs, as we know here, from June 1st to November 30th. So we get June, July, August, September, October, November. We have six months of hurricane season here. So for those of you that say, well, you have six months of cold and snow and winter, we have six months of hurricane season. At the time that I wrote this message, the storm had killed at least four people, and officials said the number of fatalities would increase in the coming days. In the news briefing that I listened to on Monday, July 1st, and I use ulterior, alternate rather, ulterior, that sounds bad, alternate. Uh, news sources. I don't use NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox News, CNN, uh, for all kinds of reasons. But on July 1st, the Prime Minister of Grenada, Dick and Mitchell, said Hurricane Barrel flattened Karakou in half an hour. The storm is the strongest hurricane ever to pass through the Windward Islands, which include Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Vincent the Grenadines. And my wife and I were through the West Indies back in 1986, and I recognize from having done, as you fly out, what we call puddle jumping up and down to the various islands before you get out. And in 2015, it looks like it says Joaquin, but it's actually Joaquin. It's a Spanish word, J-O-A-Q-U-I-N. September 27th, the Atlantic Ocean, it rapidly intensified. It moved toward the Bahamas. And Hurricane Joaquin, strengthened to a Category 4, remained at that intensity for several days as it lashed the Bahamas. Eventually, the storm curled back to the northeast, accelerated, passing by Bermuda to the west. Joaquin remained a hurricane for a few days beyond that, and it dissipated October 7th. Almost a Category 5, just barely, they utilize an instrument for estimating surface winds. The stepped frequency microwave radiometer, it's SF, SFMR, a hurricane hunter reconnaissance mission estimated the surface winds 135 knots or 155 miles per hour just before noon on October 3rd. That was just two miles per hour shy of becoming a Category 5 hurricane. By wind speed, Joaquin at the time was the strongest Atlantic hurricane since Hurricane Igor, or Igor, in 2010, it had 155 mile per hour maximum winds. And so it's been over eight years since the last five hurricane, Category 5, in the Atlantic Basin. There was Felix in 2007. Why am I talking about all this? Well, right now, those in Houston can tell you why I'm talking about this. When we went through Sally here a few years ago, we still talk about it. And every time I look out in my backyard and look up at the trees that are left, they still look like a giant weed eater went through them. And I haven't hired anyone or gone up and trimmed it to make it look better. So I'm constantly reminded of that storm because before that storm came in, the trees were beautiful and symmetric and they're not now. In recent times, massive earthquakes Tsunamis, other disasters have taken a huge toil of suffering and damage. These last few weeks, 
there have been a slew of tornadoes, extreme flooding, and it's easy to become very unsettled with all this going on. I plan to travel up to South Dakota here in a couple, three weeks, and then go down to Nebraska and see my mom and some other brethren in Iowa, scattered folks. But had I tried that about a week or 10 days ago, I wouldn't have been able to because all the interstates to get there were closed due to flooding and water being over, and there's still a lot of flooding going on. So many people wonder and they ask, why such horrendous tragedies and human suffering occur, and why doesn't a loving God intervene and prevent them from happening? Good question. I will say this, my wife and I were fervently praying along with others that this current barrel hurricane would not hit where it was supposed to hit because my folks where they live in Aransas Pass, my in-laws rather, right in Aransas Pass and Padre Island and all of the places around there were right where it was headed. And we just said, God, please be merciful. They live in mobile homes. They're anchored down, but they're still mobile homes. And when we served in Tampa, Florida, I remember in 1985 having to evacuate people because of hurricane coming in. It's not a place you want to be ever, but they don't live that far from the coast. And so we just prayed, and I believe God just said, okay, I'll do it for you. And he moved it, and now it's going through Houston. And it didn't wipe out the Sappington's house and others. So it still did a lot of damage, though. How would you answer that question, though, if someone asked you? Why does the loving God intervene and prevent them from happening? And what should our response be to such disasters? This is what I want to talk about today. This is what we need to talk about. Famous or better words would be infamous, maybe. Televangelist and host of the 700 Club, Pat Robertson, and I'm not throwing him under the bus. This is what happened. It's quite commonly known. It's all over the news. It was. Pat Robertson offered his take back in 2010 on this question on the day after the earthquake, and I quote, Quote, something happened a long time ago in Haiti and people might not want to talk about it, unquote, he said. Quote, they were under the heel of the French, you know, Napoleon III and whatever, and they got together and they swore a pact to the devil. They said, we will serve you if you will get us free from the prince. True story. And so the devil said, okay, it's a deal. And they kicked the French out. And the Haitians revolted and got something themselves free. But ever since, they have been cursed by one thing after another, unquote, Robertson said. He also said that Haitians need to have a, quote, great turning to God, unquote, while he was reporting on the devastating 7.0 earthquake that shook the island nation, the most powerful to hit the country in a century. He even called the earthquake, quote, a possible blessing in disguise, unquote. It's not the first time he may have made controversial statements in the wake of disasters. He had previously linked Hurricane Katrina and terrorist attacks to legalize abortion. Now, I'm not trying to single him out. So this is not an attack on, on him or you at all. Many others have made similar comments. Many are making a lot of comments like this right now on their prophecy revelation that everybody loves. And their inspired preaching as they lambast the world. But I believe, and please listen, I believe there's a better answer than that. You're going to get a lot of donations preaching like that. You can take Ezekiel and all the minor prophets and you can just thunder and you can send the whole nation to their grave, and the righteous ones, we rise with glory. We need to be careful with that, folks. So, let's continue. I believe there's a better answer than what we just read. 
It is certainly true that God has used large-scale disasters to punish sinners. I will not disagree with that. The Bible through Genesis, excuse me, from Genesis to Revelation offers accounts of God's punishment on mankind for their sins. Yes. The universal flood at the time of Noah. But what did God say after that? Here's a rainbow before the alternative lifestyle people perverted it. It was a sign that God said, I will never do that again. There was Sodom and Gomorrah. We all know about that. In his famous Olivet Prophecy recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, Jesus said the time of the end would be characterized by earthquakes in various places. The book of Revelation foretells massive earthquakes of unprecedented magnitude at the time of the end as an expression of God's wrath on a sinning world. Okay. That being said, it is vitally important, friends and brethren and family, to distinguish between what God does and what He simply allows to happen. There is a significant difference. And unfortunately, many children of God and many brethren can't distinguish the two. Hence, we're going to talk about that today. Distinguishing between what God does and what He simply allows to happen. Some people would consider this to be inconsequential because since God has the power to prevent disasters, He is to blame for allowing them to happen. So why doesn't He prevent them? How can we rationalize and balance the seeming contradiction of a loving, all-powerful God allowing destruction, devastation, and death on such a massive scale? The answer requires you and me to look at the bigger picture of man's response to God or lack thereof over the entire span of human history. Facebook is an awful social platform for people showing their lack of understanding of God's Word, wisdom. If everything is automatically imputed that it's Satan, it's people disobeying God, God's just beating the tar out of every one of us because of that. Then how, let's go through and let's look at some things and ask, how do we come to that rationale? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, and I have the scriptures in my notes, so I have my Bible here, but it's easier than putting my glasses on and off and reading it to read it here, but it's the same words, okay? In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, and this is a New Living Translation, then God said, let us, notice, let us, Make human beings in our image to be like ourselves. So people ask, what does God, the Father, and Jesus Christ look like? I can tell you. They look like us. It clearly implies that God designed and created human beings with the capacity to have a relationship with Him because that's what He wants. Unfortunately, we know the first humans forfeited their opportunity for a happy, successful physical life and eternal life thereafter because what? Of disobedience to God. Some of the tragic consequences are documented in Scripture. Their son, the First World War, as I call it, a quarter of the earth's population was wiped out. Their son killed his brother Abel. There's only a small handful of individuals that are mentioned as righteous prior to the time of Abraham. Again, in the New Living Translation, Genesis 5.22. Genesis 5.22. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived, as it should be, it's not Enoch. A notch is something you can put in your handle of your revolver or your your, uh, 
knife or a, a fence post or a tree. But Enoch lived in a close fellowship with God for another 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, in the New King James, then the Eternal saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. This is something we need to consider right now too, folks. The device, the thought of all people alive in their heart is not evil continually. But we want to force everything into it's going to all end in the next year now. That's exciting. That brings in money. That makes us look like a prophet. We need to be careful. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. So as we know, God destroyed all the rest of mankind in the flood and started over with Noah and his family. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, then he said, Genesis 11, verse 4. Then he said, Come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches unto the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. You know who that was. We even have a saying now, we're used to when I was growing up, somebody's acting like a Nimrod. It's not a complimentary thing. Josephus, the historian, claims that this was Nimrod's scheme to protect mankind from being destroyed in a flood. Get them up high enough that there can't be the water level high enough to do it again. The Expositor's Bible Commentary observes this. The focus of the author since the beginning chapters of the book of Genesis has been both on God's plan to bless mankind by providing them with that which is good and on man's failure to trust God and enjoy the good God has provided. The characteristic mark of man's failure up to this point in the book has been his attempt to grasp the good on his own rather than trust God to provide it for. God's next attempt to build a relationship with mankind began with Abraham, culminating the nation of Israel that God set apart as a special people to him. We all know because we have the book, we can read it, hopefully we are, how miserable most of them, miserably most of them failed, except for a small handful of righteous individuals. Moses, in my opinion, no doubt had his hands full with a largely recalcitrant, rebellious nation that continually accused and blamed him and God for all their troubles, right? The second generation underneath Joshua, they did a little better. But then came the time in the history that's recorded of the judges. And if I could give you, if I had a whiteboard here, which I thought about, I could write it down. Most of the book of Judges consists of numerous repetitions of the same cycle. Here we go. There's seven things. One, Israel is blessed by God. Two, Israel becomes disobedient. God then, number three, punishes Israel. And then Israel cries out for God to deliver them. And God in His mercy delivers them. Israel then returns to disobedience. And God punishes them again, and then He delivers them. Pretty simple. If you think about it, any of us have the same seven things over and over and over in our life. Kind of reminds me of the old song, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Or I love this one, When Will They Ever Learn? (laughs) When will we ever learn? I've thought about this in the different congregations I've served people, brethren, God's children, and I can go back, way back, decades. And it's always the same problems and the same patterns and the same thing, just different people. And I do the same thing. There are things that you just, you replicate over and over and over. God 
sent numerous prophets to warn the nation of the consequences of their sin to encourage them to repent. We're going through. We just finished Hosea. Now we're starting Joel in the Bible basics that we do every Tuesday. He encouraged them to repent, and he got mixed results, primarily unsuccessful. In Ezekiel chapter 33, Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11, God says, as surely as I live, says the sovereign eternal Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. Please read this with me. I surely as I live, says God, the eternal, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn! Turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? That sums up, I think. God's feelings for his people. Eventually, we know the story, both nations ended up going to national captivity because of their sins. And all of this was what God said was his special people who had God to watch over and care for them. The rest of mankind wasn't even in the ball game, if you say it that way, so to speak. But they wandered farther and farther away from God. So God did what? He sent Jesus Christ to offer salvation first to Israel and then to individuals of all nations. He is rejected and what? Put to death by his own people of Judah. He then also formed the New Testament church. But over time, the church became persecuted, infiltrated, wolves came in, it fragmented. Not very much unlike what we see today, if you have eyes to see. Today, Christianity is divided and beset by doctrinal differences and often at odds with fellow believers, even within the same church organization. In the world... And in those that try to keep the Sabbath and the holy days. Then you have countless other religions, most of, most of which are also fragmented. And of course, you add to that atheists, agnostics, witches, warlocks, and Satan worshipers, dot, dot, dot. Yet, God is somehow expected to bail out everyone from their problems and not allow anyone to suffer, right? So my question, and hence my title, Natural Disasters, has God turned himself, his back on mankind? In that sense, you could say yes, but not permanently. More correctly, mankind has turned its back on God. And God is simply allowing the consequences of man's evil ways to take their toll. Now, I have diabetes. Conclusively, part of it is genetic. It came from my genes and my biological family. But I'm not going to tell you I didn't exacerbate it by what I've eaten, my lifestyle. You know, in this job, the stress, my cortisol levels, they get high. You may think, how can there be any stress in this job? Oh, trust me, plenty at times. So can, can we conclude logically that all problems are God's punishment for sin and that righteous people never suffer? Well, then you and I, we must not be very righteous at all if we suffer. Again, I'm reminded of Job's situation in a case point to show the folly of that claim. God described him as a man who is upright and eschewed evil. And I've heard some really ridiculous sermons by men that claim to be his servants that Job was self-righteous and he just needed to see that. I don't read that. I don't see that. In the New Living Translation, Job chapter 1, verse 8, then the eternal asked Satan, 
Notice, Satan didn't bring it before him. He picked and said to to Satan, he did. Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. I don't know if God can say that about me. How about you? So it's not correct to assume that all suffering is God's punishment for sin. Smack them, beat them, bang them, correct them, give it to them, as some thunder. Pat Robinson was not the first to suggest that natural disasters are God's punishment heaped on a mankind because of their sin. You remember friends of Job? I have friends like this too. Remember Job's friends? In Job chapter 4, verse 7 to 9, they said, Stop and think, do the innocent die? When have the upright been destroyed? My experience shows those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. A breath from God destroys them. They vanish in a blast of his anger. They were so free with their great advice. Consider the words of Jesus Christ in response to a couple of tragedies during the time of his earthly ministry. Let's go over to Luke chapter 13, verse 1 to 5. In Luke chapter 13, verse 1 to 5, about this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. And he asked, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? And Jesus asked, is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them and crushed them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No, I tell you again, unless you repent, you will perish too. Barclay's Daily Study Bible says, We cannot say that individual suffering and sin are inevitably connected, but we can say that national sin and suffering are so connected. The nation which chooses the wrong ways will in the end suffer for it. But the individual is a very different case. He is not an isolated unit. He is bound up in the bundle of life. Often he may object and object violently to the course his nation is taking. But when the consequences of that course comes, he cannot escape being part of it. The individual is often caught up in a situation which he did not make. His suffering is often not his fault, but the nation is a unit and chooses its own policy and reaps the fruit of it. It's always dangerous to attribute human sufferings to human sin. But always safe to say the nation which rebels against God is on its way to disaster. Now, I could spend the rest of the message time and then some documenting warnings from the prophets of the Old Testament to the nations of Israel and Judah. Do you think about Nineveh to repent or suffer punishment on a national scale? Barclay's point is when nations are punished, individual citizens suffer. Not because their personal sin is greater than the others, but simply because of being caught up in the middle of the punishment aimed at the nation. A so-called natural disaster, such as a hurricane, tornado, tsunami, earthquake, it's been my experience, it's not a respecter of persons. So am I agreeing with Pat Robertson? I have a couple, three problems with his response and others that claim similarly. And we have some that are thundering it right now. I get calls and say, you know, or is your name so-and-so? Nope, that's not me. That's a different guy. And nope. Okay, well, I want to I hear the prophecy. I know you do. My experience has been, I've been part of this for a long time in the church. When you give something, if I talk about the book of Revelation, and began to explain all the nuances of that. And man, people love it. You get a large following of people. Or if you start talking about the place of safety that the Philadelphian church will be protected while everyone else suffers and dies. And you're in Petra watching the nuclear bombs fly over and all the war, and you're sitting in your cave with an air conditioner and a latte 
reading, I don't know what, Outdoor Life, I guess, the magazine, and you're not a hair in your head is touched, there's a little bit of a distortion of what Scripture says, folks. Yes, there is. You need to read what's going to happen. How did Mr. Robertson know that the earthquake or Katrina was a punishment from God? We know the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah were God's punishment of sinners because the Bible tells us so, very specifically. You know, his timing... Couldn't have been worse the day after the earthquake struck while the victims are still suffering in a state of shock. My question, very importantly, and why I'm talking about this today, where is compassion? Mark chapter 1, turn with me, Mark chapter 1, verse 35 to 41, please. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, I get that. I was up this morning sitting on the back porch at 4.15. He went out and he departed to a solitary place and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said, everyone's looking for you. But he said, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also because this purpose have I come forth. At verse 39, he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all of Galilee and casting out demons. And a leper, verse 40, came to him, imploring him, kneeling down and saying, if you are willing, make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and he touched him, and he said, I am willing, be cleansed. In Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, verse 29, to 34. Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him, and behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David! It says exclamation point there. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David! So Jesus stood still and called them, and he said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion, and he touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. In neither of these cases do we see Jesus writing off, getting rid of, casting away these suffering people as sinners reaping punishment from God. Rather, we see his initial response as being moved with compassion and healing the victims. He spoke a parable concerning believers to offer practical help to suffering victims. In Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him up, and they left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed by. He said, ooh, and he moved over here. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by the other side. You know, a ministerial trainee, a ministerial assistant. Then a despised Samaritan came along. A dirt ball. A low life. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion. He went over to him. The Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. And the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. And then he writes, it's recorded in verse 36, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? And Jesus asked that. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. 
So there was a priest, a minister. He hastened past. No doubt he was remembering he was touched. A dead man was unclean for seven days. Numbers 19.11. He could not be sure, but he feared that the man was dead. To touch him would mean losing his turn of duty in the, duty in the temple and refused to risk that. He set the claims of ceremony above those of what? Love. The temple and its liturgy meant more to him than the pain of a man. Who cares if this man is in pain? By our actions. For we uphold the righteousness of the church. Pardon my sarcasm. Then there was the Levite. He seems to have gone nearer to the man, but then he passed on. Then there was the Samaritan. The listeners would obviously expect that this was the arrival. The villain had arrived. Ha <laughs> ha! He may not have been racially a Samaritan at all. The Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans, and yet this man seems to have been a kind of commercial traveler who was a regular visitor at the inn. In John 8, 48, the Jews called Jesus a Samaritan. The name was sometimes used to describe as a man who was a heretic and a breaker of the ceremonial law. Perhaps this man was a Samaritan in the sense of being one whom all Orthodox good, righteous people despised. We note a couple things about him. His credit was good. Clearly, the innkeeper was prepared to trust him. He may have been theologically unsound to some, but he was an honest man. Oh, there's so many things I could say here. But he alone was prepared to help. A heretic he may have been, but the love of God was in his heart. It is no new experience to find the Orthodox more interested in dogma and their doctrine and their form than in help to find the man the Orthodox despised to be the one who loves his fellow men. In the end, we will be judged not by the creed we hold, but the life we live. And I hope some hear this. The form, your rigidness, your exactness, your doctrine, your perfection with everything, your fellowship, whatever it is that is yours, that has your name. What type of life do you live? Because if you say, I was part of this group, that group, he was my minister, this, that, I supported this, I was part of that, you may have a surprise coming. But nobody wants to hear this. Oh, I'm just bitter and sour grapes. No, no, I'm not. I'm just trying to help people understand what does God's Word say versus what we've always thought it said. Where do you, I, you and I fit in this parable? Are we moved with compassion and consider what we can do to help alleviate the suffering of victims of disasters? Or do we reason our way out doing anything to help? I'm kind of ashamed to admit that the church at times long ago used to say that trying to do good in this world is like painting the deck of a sinking ship. Since this world is passing away, and we will be replaced with a wonderful world tomorrow, which is true. But some thought that we should channel all of our donations to preach the gospel. You know, get that magazine, get that television show out there, get that radio program out there to prepare them for that coming time because that's the only solution to the problems of mankind. And we quickly blame all people with disobedience to God and thereby they are going to suffer. Well, then what do we say when we, you and me, why? When we suffer. And by the way, with what is coming, you will suffer. And I will suffer. Yeah. Now there are certain groups you can hop into that teach that that will never happen. Knock yourself out. Go for it. But that's not what the Bible says. 
Hebrews 11 says, all these suffered and died. And then it goes in great detail. Sawn asunder, burned at the stake, starved to death, beat to a pulp. Stephen, remember Stephen? You know what's interesting? When Stephen was stoned, God the Father and Christ didn't intervene. Christ stood up and cheered him on and said, here, here, this, this physical life's about done. Good job, Stephen. Well, what about John the Baptist? When John had his head removed, separated, that ain't a good thing. Christ was in the vicinity, and he didn't intervene. Why? All these died not yet having received the promise. So you know what that means? Every person that's ever lived that suffered was evil and deserved to be beat on because that they just were disobedient. That's not a functional mentality. So what is wrong with some of this reasoning? Jesus said his purpose was to preach the gospel, but he still took the time and effort to what? Help the needy, suffering people with his compassion and mercy. I do not like the prayer requests that used to go out. Please pray for our brethren. Yeah, but what about all the other people? Or I'd get a phone call. Are all the brethren safe? I like, I think so. But what about all these other people suffering? Well, they don't matter. They're not part of our church. We don't say that. Right? Another objection is that we are so limited in terms of time and money that whatever we might offer would be inconsequential of having a meaningful effect, especially in a disaster of this magnitude. I'm going to read a story. It's going to be a touchy-feely story. This is partly for my granddaughter. There once was a man walking along the beach. The sun was shining, it was a beautiful day, and off in the distance he could see a person going back and forth between the surf's edge and the beach. Back and forth this person went, and he was curious. As the man approached, he could see that there were hundreds of starfish that were stranded on the sand as a result of the natural action of the tide. And the man was struck by the apparent futility of the task. He thought, what are you doing? There's far too many starfish. Many of them were going to perish, obviously. As he approached the person, continued the task of picking up a starfish one by one and throwing them back out into the surf. My wife and I did this in Cartagena with the sand dollars. Remember that? You'd find them with your feet, and you'd pick them up, and they'd kind of, as you stroked them, they would all move the little hairs on the bottom, and, you know, you'd clean them off, and then you'd take and set them over the water and let them go. I never was one to get one and put it in bleach to kill it so I could have it on my bookshelf, but I don't think. But he came up to the person. He said, you've got to be crazy. There are thousands of miles of beach covered with these starfish. What you're doing isn't going to help at all. It's not going to make a difference to anybody or anything. And the person looked at the man with a very serious look. And he stooped down and he picked up one more and he threw it out to the surf and he turned back to the said to the man, it sure made a difference to that starfish. I know many years at the Port of Feast of Tabernacles in Puerto Vallarta, a similar experience with baby sea turtles happens on the beach, whether you like it or not. It's interesting. There's an ecological institute there that cares for sea turtles, and their staff brought about 400 baby turtles to the hotel where the feast is held. They made people line up and gave each person a baby sea turtle. Following their instructions, all the brethren released their baby turtles at the same time on the sand that helped them get to the ocean. Nobody could step forward to avoid stepping in the little turtles. Some turtles were brought back by the waves, so they had to be lifted and put back in the sand again until they were carried out by the water. They tried to release them at night, as during the day they would be eaten by birds and other predators. And not all of them survive. And normally only 5% five, five make it to the water and live. And what, with this little event, it rises above 20%. Well, if I'm getting 5% interest on my money that I'm trying to save, and somebody says, I'll give you 20, that's quite a bit. 
So what is my purpose of talking about this? We live in a dying world full of suffering people. We are called to help preach the good news of the kingdom and prepare for that that's coming to this earth. We're not trying to save the world today or preach what is called the social gospel that alleges that we must band together to save the world and usher in the kingdom of God by simply doing good works. I'm not saying that at all. We're very, we're part of, we are very small, a part of a very small group. Even if you lump all the fellowships together, we're not a drop in the bucket. Church of God Ministries is not equipped to be a relief organization that can offer disaster assistance on the scale needed, such as the Hurricane Katrina or the earthquake in Haiti or Hurricane Barrel. We're not. Our first concern are those that I know and fellow people that are trying to obey God, but not to the exclusion of other suffering people. But I give first priority because of our limited resources. I get inundated with requests for help and money. I can't help everybody. Sometimes I help some. Those that we serve that regularly connect and are part of what we do and talk with them and encourage them and counsel them, I do what I can, but I can't help everybody. But as individual members, for those of you that are watching, we can and should respond with compassion and offer whatever help, albeit limited, to help suffering people by serving when as we can and contributing to relief agencies designed and equipped to offer assistance. On a scale, commensurate with the need if we have it to do so. But if you don't have it, you can't give it. Final scripture, let's look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. I served as a firefighter for over a decade in the state of Wisconsin. And I look back now, a lot of the health issues I have stem from that. And the pain, the joints, all the training, all the things we did, I know that. But when I did that, I would not take it back and say I wouldn't do it if I could do it over. In Galatians 6.10, it says, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity... We should good, do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. I may, it may sound a little corny, but ask God to help you find one starfish that you can save. As we see the intensity of things in the world, stop and ask yourself, am I any better or different than all these people? Do we please God, our Father, perfectly? I say we do not. But the world and this nation that we live in, it's headed over the proverbial cliff, folks. That's true. Don't simply think because we know God and we are His children that we will not suffer physically or have very difficult, strenuous times. We will. God's Word is clear about that. But let us not forget, we must continually pray as we raise our hands to Him. Our Father in heaven, praise be Your name, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That prayer is desperately needed to be focused, clear, concise, thought out, meditated, mused, pondered on, and considered continually. Join me as we close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, God, we love you. We thank you. We come before you. Ask your blessing. Thank you for protecting those that are my family and Gail's family and brethren there where it was coming. Please be with those in all of the folks that are in the path and in the middle of this barrel hurricane in Houston and ongoing areas. Those that are attempting to love you and seek you, Father, just comfort and courage, bless them, protect them. 
And Father, we know there's going to be suffering in this world, but help us not to jump on that bandwagon, bandwagon of, yeah, give it to them, they deserve it. For Father, if it were not for you opening our hearts and minds and our response, except for the grace of God, there go we. Protect us, bless us, encourage us, help us. Thank you. We love you and praise you and give you thanks. And we pray this to you in the name of our elder brother, our Savior, our Lord and Master, your Son, our High Priest, and as he told us to call him, our friend. And we say in English, Jesus, the Christ, the Anointed One. In that name, we pray as instructed by Scripture. Amen. Thank you.